Okay, we now have reached the final phase of our two-day event, and it is a part of the event that everyone always tends to look forward to enormously, and that is a more informal panel discussion that includes uh, someone who is active in the field of art collecting and someone who is actually a collector, him or herself. So I will we'll do this as a bit of a domino thing, and I'm going to introduce Lionel Pizarro, and then uh, our collector, George Schnurk, who hails from Dallas and who has been collecting Impressionist art for nearly a decade, uh, will be introduced by Rick Brittell, and then we will just sit back and enjoy. Uh, Lionel Pizarro uh, will be moderating our panel, joined by Rick and Joachim and, uh, May and, and George Schnurk. Lionel studied art history in London before joining Phillips Auctioneers in 1985. And in 1989, he and his wife, Sandrine Mousse Pissarro, founded a private uh, firm specializing in private transactions of 19th and 20th century works of art. Although his chief passion uh, is for Impressionism and modern art, uh, he holds a keen interest as well and, and a great expertise in contemporary art. So now with more than 30 years in private advising, Lionel's clients have come to view him as a paragon of trust and of discretion, discretion being always important in art collecting. At the root of his business model is a commitment to personal attention and respect for confidentiality that differs directly from what can be uh, offered by large public auction houses and galleries. So following two long-standing business partnerships with Franck Giraud and Philippe Segalo, uh, and more recently with Thomas Seydoux and Stephanie Connery, Lionel and Sandrine now operate their own international private art advisory business, Pizarro and Associates. Uh, this uh, is based in London, uh, where they relocated from Paris about two years ago. Over the course of his career, Lionel and his team have helped form and build many important art collections, selling to private collectors as well as to institutions and museums. His love of art and respect for artists was fostered for generations in his family and began with his great-grandfather, of course, the painter Camille Pizarro, and is furthered in other dimensions by his brother Joachim. So welcome, Lionel. And now, Rick, if you will introduce uh, George, who I know that you have, uh, you have followed his collecting over these recent years. OK, OK. Well, I'm out of this now. It is all up to you. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. I, uh, like all of you, I enjoyed a lot all these uh, wonderful lectures over the past uh, two days, focusing on these uh, early collectors of uh, Impressionism, the pioneers. We tend to admire a lot the pioneers, but the pioneers have heirs, they have followers. And um, so I believe that most of the lectures we've heard, maybe aside from Joachim's one, which was already bridging towards uh, recent history of collecting Impressionism, but most of the authors were really dealing with the roots of uh, uh, in collecting Impressionism. And uh, now I think what we are going to try is to do a zoom forward and try to uh, discuss what is going on now in terms of collecting Impressionism and where is it happening. I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think. Yeah. No. My voice can cut through anything. <laughs> I, uh, it would be interesting to, con to talk about the global. Well, I mean, yeah. We've only gone global with the. Um, yeah. So basically, there's been. In the recent years, there's been two phases. Uh, I would now speak of our lifetime, covering the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, where Impressionism was obviously um, uh, at the top of the art market. There was nothing more expensive that you could acquire in the market for all of these decades. And, and you have seen how this uh, has been 
basically traveling all over the world. And Japan was obviously uh, very powerful in the last moment of those few decades. Then you know that the Japanese economy was hit very strongly around 1990, and that this decline of the Japanese economy has also affected uh, the art market, because so much money from Japan had been uh, invested into art. Suddenly, there was um, a downside, which was the early 1990s. And simultaneously, there was also uh, the shift was beginning, where we were beginning to see 20th century artists selling for more money than the Impressionist painters. So uh, th those two events, uh, and there is also the moment when I remember a journalist who was covering the auctions here in New York was mentioning that for the first time, a contemporary auction had um, brought as much money as an Impressionist sell, and that was surprising to everybody. Now, contemporary auctions achieve far more uh, turnover than any Impressionist sell, and the gap is so big that uh, it, it won't uh, be matched again. Contemporary art now is way ahead of the Impressionist market. So that's, again, a second phase during those recent decades, which is the recent history of the market of uh, Impressionism worldwide. Well, in the auction, it is ch the, the word Impressionism has a different meaning in the catalogs and the designations of the catalogs. Now it's Impressionist and modern, and then contemporary is oftentimes added to it. So in a, in a certain sense, Impressionist painting has is, is gone way down in terms of its total value in the market, and that's a, that's a big change. Yeah, in uh, 30 years. It hasn't gone down. It it, it hasn't has gone, gone up, gone up. <laughs> as yeah. much yeah. as contemporary art. Yes. So you have, uh, you definitely have uh, now uh, a much bigger difference. There was a moment where people like uh, myself and others I can see in this room were wondering what the future of the market of impressionist paintings was going to be, yeah. because we were uh, seeing. Um, fewer buyers, fewer very good works offered on the market, and, and uh, we were a bit worried for a moment. Fortunately, there were people like Mr. Plattner, Mr. Howard, who um, have made their names uh, for uh, building up very substantial collections of Impressionist art, um, but that was... Um, uh, uh, that was beginning to, to become rarer. And what has happened very recently, and now we're talking about the very recent history, is that at the time where, when we were slightly worried of what the future phase of the Impressionist market was going to be, we are beginning to see China coming in mm -hmm. as a new player, and a, a player that we haven't really quite uh, measured yet. Right. But, uh, and, and again, in this respect, we are not going to contradict George Shackelford, who uh, has discussed the Monet mania, because clearly in China, Monet is subject of an absolute cult, and so the Monet mania uh, is not about to decline, I believe. Yeah, it's a, it, I, I lecture, as does Joachim, uh, quite a lot in China, and it's fascinating to get, because I, when I want to lecture on Surah, and I'm told, oh, we haven't heard of him, nobody knows who Surah is, you could lecture on somebody else instead, and so I'll say Gauguin, well, maybe not Gauguin, Van Gogh. So, and, and, so, and for the Impressionists, it's Monet, 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 Monet. You know, it's not, that who, who cares about Pizarro, Duga, Renoir, <laughs> sort of, and it's, there is a, clearly there's a sort of popularity of, of, a, of, these, of star artists in China that's been caused by I don't know what, because their museums are, until now, substandard. There's nothing for them to look at, really, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I think at some point there was a Renoir mania as well, but, yeah. uh, but, but clearly now the Monet mania is... Yeah. is is way ahead, and possibly of Van Gogh, obviously, yes. Van yeah. Gogh was. 
and we could, we'll discuss l larger things. I want to introduce um, my good friend George Schnurk. Um, we thought it would be good to have a, an active collector and one who is, is now actually in the market of Impressionism in a very knowledgeable way, largely because it isn't so crazy in terms of prices. You know, one can actually form an Impressionist collection now um, in a way that it's, it's much more difficult to form a really high-level collection of post-impressionism or cubism or contemporary art um, in, in, with a domestic budget and a, and a house. And George lives in a house in, the, in North Dallas, um, which you, know, you drive by at any time and you would never know what was in it. You couldn't predict um, what was in it. And George is one there. I, I came to Dallas uh, 28 years ago now. Um, as the director of the Dallas Museum of Art, and at that time there were two um, collectors of Impressionist painting who had been quite active in the markets before, one who bought exclusively from Wildensteins, um, and the other who kind of played, uh, bought in London and, and Paris and um, New York from various dealers. Um, one of them was Margaret McDermott, who died last week at, at 106, and who bought her pictures when they cost $250,000 and $80,000 and occasionally a million dollars. So at a time in the 60s and 70s when still the prices weren't so much. And the other collector, who might uh, unfortunately cannot name, um, is a collector who buys everything from Wildensteins. No, there are no other suppliers uh, from this collection, and it's bought at incredibly high prices. So there are two different kinds of collectors. Since then, um, there have been five collections of Impressionism that are being currently formed in one city. Um, which shows you really how uh, alive it can be um, to be a collector of Impressionism. And George is both the youngest um, and the person who, in, of all the collectors I know, is the mo most is, is a really passionate collector. Um, is completely involved in in learning about pictures in his own collection and who can speak about them very knowledgeably. He's uh, at, suggested that I speak about them because he doesn't want to come off as promoting himself. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you the pictures that he's uh, acquired in the last few years. If, can I get the PowerPoint? Is that possible? Here, let's go back. And that's the beginning. Okay, they're, they're, I'm putting them up in, uh, in, the, in chronological order of their making rather than in, in the order in which they were acquired. And this is a, a really beautiful Sicily that Joachim and Lionel and George can't see because it's um, on the screen on the side, um, which a uh, beautiful spring scene uh, painted in, uh, in uh, um, oh shit, what's the name of that town? Louvicien? Louvicien? Louvicien. Yeah, Louvcien. No, it's yeah, Louvcien. That's right. And here, here you can see how gloriously painted it is. And um, it, like many of the pictures, indeed, I think almost all of the paintings in this collection are unlined. And for those of you who know wh what that means, it means that it hasn't had a new canvas ironed onto the back, wrecking the 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 facture of the original, like most pictures in an American museum collection. Sadly. Um, the museums wanting to preserve their works of art actually did more damage to them than private collectors. This is a really gorgeous um, beach scene from the south of France by Morisot um, with her daughter playing in the sand um, and looking down the beach. And here you see a photograph of the, of the same motif over here. And you can see that she's very carefully cut off this god-awful building. Um, over here, so it's not there, and she's a bit back, and she was working both on, in, on paper with watercolors um, on that same trip, and with this incredible freshness, and again, unlined, and that ball, you know, it's so, it's so wonderful, that little um, sphere down below, which has been being temporarily neglected by Julie. This is a fantastic um, floral still life with chrysanthemums um, um, by Renoir, which was also, the, in fact, this, both this and this, this both the Sicily and the uh, the Morisot were in impressionist exhibitions, as was the Renoir. So these are pictures that were shown by the artists when they were new, and they were cataloged in the impressionist exhibitions. And this one also is a fantastic facture um, that I. 
I, I think he bought this a little bit because of me, because I love Cicely Pastels. Um, and Cicely Pastels are very little known and very little recognized. And in fact, there are a whole series of them made at the same time towards the end of his life as he's sitting on the front porch of a little rented house um, looking out and, and representing the trains as they go by, these completely banal um, subjects which he turns into real poetry. One of the great, first really great Gauguin still lifes. Um, and this is a, a stunningly beautiful picture. And here, oops, here is the vase, by, also by Gauguin, which is represented in it. And here is the painting in the Chicago um, exhibition, the recent Chicago exhibition, um, with this amazing, it's a lotus flower and growing out of itself. The, the vase is just as weird as the painting. And the painting has these wonderful two manners, and they uh, uh, reflect Gauguin as a, as a collector and painter. The, the lower um, plate of apples is painted more or less in the manner of Cezanne, and of course he owned um, works by Cezanne and looked at them very carefully. And his new synthetist manner um, is the oranges or whatever the hell those fruits are um, in the vase. So it's a fat, really important and fascinating um, Gauguin still life. This is actually the first picture he bought, which is a, a Dieppe Harbor picture by Pizarro. And what's fascinating is you can go into the long gallery at the Frick and see this huge turner of the Dieppe Harbor, and you would swear it was two completely different places. But Pizarro painted there at the end of his life. Here you can see another painting in a private collection in Dallas, Miss, actually Mrs. McDermott's collection up here. And then this kind of panorama which George is good on the computer, and so he puts his painting with another painting of the rest of the harbor um, to show the whole thing. And this is, in fact, George showing this computer thing to Mrs. McDermott um, just before her death when she came to, see, to meet this young collector who is following in her footsteps in Dallas. And here one sees it with this is better light. It's taken from a cell phone, oftentimes the best. This is a recent acquisition, a really wonderful and almost impossible to photograph picture, um, which was painted um, on the, in, you know, in the winter um, on the Seine at the town of Vettoy, where he lived, and which is related to the huge painting, um, which he sent to the Impressionist Exhibition of 1882, um, which is in the Petit Palais. And you can see him rehearsing um, the composition on a small scale before taking up um, the large scale uh, uh, canvas. And what's interesting for us in Dallas is that this picture, the large picture which he painted for the Salon in 1882, um, is in the Dallas Museum. And last week at the Rockefeller uh, sale, one of the smaller versions of it sold for some ungodly sum that one doesn't want to know. Um, he also has a, for a very early acquisition of a wonderful painting by Jacques Villon, um, which is a painting done in preparation for one of the largest paintings of, of Villon's career in 1913 of the Puto Cubis. And then George is, is moved um, into the 20th century with a fantastic late um, Bonar landscape. And so one sees in one house in one city with one buyer who carefully looks at the market and who buys unlined pictures that we learn after he's bought them what they really are and what they really mean because we have a chance to look at them carefully. And I thought all of you would like to meet George. Here's another view, and here's a photograph of the scene in the south of France. And here you can see the Impressionist pictures. And what he liked, this, he did the PowerPoint. This picture looks much better with fauve landscapes than it looks with Impressionist pictures. And it's one of the things when you know this when you're a collector, is you buy something and you think, oh, this was painted in the early 1880s or 1880, and it'll look great with all the other Impressionist pictures of 1880, and it doesn't because it's a different kind of picture. And so rooms and light um, affects pictures very differently. He's fond of saying that he gets to walk by each of them every day and several times a day. And that's, of course, something you cannot do when you visit a museum. You, if you live in a city, you can go back repeatedly. Um, but living, uh, Impressionism is really about living with art. And thank God there are still collectors like George. The wonderful, again, the, and this is the uh, photograph of the Renoir in Uget Clark's um, apartment, which was two blocks from here down Fifth Avenue. 
Um, she had two floors, and, and this we thought was amusing. Um, you know, here's Lonesome George who comes in to be, ter to be uh, sort of terminated in life um, to New York and is per perpetually um, embalmed or as a tortoise across the street. And, and George often feels like the Lonesome George of Impressionist collecting. Are there any others of me? Am I all alone? What am I doing? And so without further in to do, I introduce George Nurk. Sit on? Okay. All I can say is I am not going anywhere near the Museum of Natural History on this trip. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? To talk, talk about acquiring them and living with them. And give well, us a little. They were basically acquired to be lived with. They weren't going to go in a quasi museum like some of these collectors had. Just or like. Is it just into it more? Have it near you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's do it. Go here. Okay, is this better? Yeah. They, they were required to be lived with, first and foremost. And when I got to where I had enough of a budget to collect museum quality art, I looked at what was the market, and early, I love French art, and early 20th century was so expensive, and that's all the Impressionists cost? Well, everybody loves Impressionism, even if they don't admit it. And so that was an easy decision. And, None of these paintings were very expensive by the standards of the Rockefeller sale. You can buy really good world quality Impressionism art in the market right now. It's still there. You have to be picky, but it's there. So we, to, 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 I know this is becoming awkward, but anyway, because it's not promotion about George. What I wanted to say is that um, there, uh, Claire Grunwell, one of our dear friends, did an exhibition at the Marbaton Museum about two years ago called Impressionisme Privé, Impressionist pictures still in private collections that you look at in homes. And it was a wonderful idea um, to bring together works of art that remain in homes because we tend to think now of Impressionism as, as museum art. And the collections were from here and there. There's a big collection in Mexico City, and there are a bunch of old collections in France and in Paris that um, let things go. We, D D Dallas loaned 10 things, and they were all from different collections. So I was very proud that it, this rather young Texas city has the kind of uh, discernment and works a lot with the museum um, so that we, we, are, we know how to look at works of art carefully and we know how to make judgments and we can compare them with works in, dare I say, our better, the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, um, and also in the Dallas Museum of Art, and, and who kind of for, formed a little group. And I think you learned uh, from several of the lectures about the root collectors of Impressionism that many of them knew each other, whether they lived in Berlin or in Paris or in London or in New York or Chicago or Boston. They were people who were formed little groups and they went to each other's houses. They were friendly with each other. They occasionally competed, you know, who has the better Cezanne or who has the better Monet. And, and the, this idea of, uh, of works of art being part of a community of a small community and an intimate community grows very much out of the movement itself, um, which were all of these rather diverse artists um, who sometimes got along better than uh, other times, um, but who managed to create uh, eight exhibitions together. What I find fascinating is that when you look at the real Impressionism, that is, the works that the Impressionists themselves chose to exhibit um, in the eight exhibitions between 1874 and 1886, um, we have today forgotten about 80% of the artists. Um, and there are artists who w w many, many, even professionals, don't know anything about um, who exhibited in certain of the less selective Impressionist exhibitions, like the first Impressionist exhibition. And what happens is we've winnowed down this large group to a small group of the essential artists. And we've done that with the collectors too. It's why we had to point out to you that several of the collectors like this guy named Jules Cazin, who we bar barely know his name in this part of the 20th century, and they liked him as much as Monet. And he never exhibited with the group because he was a salon artist. What we've done is we've created, we've winnowed so much that there are essentially eight or nine artists who are part of this larger group where, we, who are now considered Impressionists. And what's really fascinating is that the, of the four great post-Impressionist painters, 
Seurat, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Gauguin. Three of them, the only one not uh, is Van Gogh, three of them exhibited with the Impressionists. And Gauguin exhibited in five of the eight Impressionist exhibitions. And so we would never think of this movement as much as an incubator for later advanced art than it actually was. And I think that that's also fascinating with the collections because the Boston collectors didn't continue into Gauguin Van Gogh quite as much as, as the Chicago collectors or as the Japanese collectors. And to sort of think about who, who did and who didn't and what was before Impressionism and what was after Impressionism. And even today, I mean, George's um, works of art, the, his Gauguin was painted in 1888, which was just two years after the movement formally dissolved before they finished doing exhibitions. Um, and his Bonar is later, but all of the rest of the paintings are classic high Impressionist art. And we still have much to learn from that. We think that we know it all, but we don't. Ask George a few questions. Uh, uh, two questions that come to my mind. First, when was the first acquisition uh, of the, the collection we saw? And second question, since that first acquisition, would you say that your taste has changed? Well, the, 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 it's about 10 years is the period of time back to the first one. And I don't think that my tastes have changed. If anything, I've become a little bit more of a connoisseur. You know, what, what's an A impressionist painting and what's a B impressionist painting? But we can hear you. Okay. But the one thing I really would like to say is we've talked about art advisors and people such as people such as that art advisors for some of the collectors and all. We would not have this core of impressionist collectors in Dallas without Rick Bertel. <laughs> But there are also, I, and the, the, the best, I'm a really good art advisor because I don't charge. <laughs> <laughs> so the money question is. <laughs> <laughs> I, the other thing I want to say before I want to hear what Joachim thinks is that we, we have, uh, we've done the roots and we've left out a lot of the biggest and most significant American collectors of Impressionism of the next generation. I mean, what about Norton Simon? What about Paul Mellon? What about these people who really formed important and major collections? And because they're not pioneers, um, it's easy to kind of put them in a secondary uh, category. Robert Lehman. I mean, Robert Lehman's father collected old master pictures, and his first job as a young graduate of Yale University was to do a formal catalog of his father's old master's collect collections, which he added to um, through his life, but his love was Impressionism and modern art, and the, and the contribution of that part of his collection um, to the larger history of art is something that now one can measure. Um, in, and then. Annenberg. I mean, where would we be without this man from Philadelphia who moves, builds a compound in California and then gives his collection to the Met while his old friends in Philadelphia are twirling around in their graves? I mean, these extraordinary big collections um, that are really important. With, for Norton Simon, for example, he started as a collector of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. And he began to realize that you can't understand those paintings unless you understand the entire history of European easel pictures, that they're a contribution to a longer history, even though they appear to be a break from it. And so his collection was the opposite of uh, Robert Lehman, of Bobby Lehman, who started with Old Masters and added Impressionism. And Norton Simon started with Impressionism and added Old Masters, wanting to learn the ways in which, and you can measure it in his museum, um, this new art form, which thought of itself as being detached um, from the formal history of the easel picture, was in fact a contribution to that history. Um, something which is fascinating for a collector to learn. Yeah. Uh, so, so just segueing on, on what, uh, what Rick is saying, and I think this is absolutely true. I mean, the, the whole the history of collecting Impressionism 
we could have not uh, two days, but a, a week-long seminar, right? And, uh, and what, what actually interests me, uh, something we haven't really mentioned much, uh, is the uh, maybe the taste of the 20s, which is, it seems uh, that there are certain parameters, certain uh, uh, factors in common, that whether you look at the Oscar, Oscar Reinhardt Sammlung, uh, 20 minutes away from Walter's house in the central part of Zurich, or, uh, or the Dr. Barnes, uh, you know, or Bürle. Bürle is another example, great example. And in those days, it's, uh, things that became complete anathema after World War II, such as putting next together, to, to, to side, side by side, Barnes is a perfect example, late Renoir, these gummy figures that seem to have to be boneless and have not just be done with nothing but rosy, pinky flesh, you know, and next to the most astounding Cezanne. And you see that over and over and over. For us, it's, it's, it's very difficult to accept, except I have one student at Hunter, right, who worships late Renoir. Uh, but uh, other than George is doing an exhibition of Renoir nude. So well, George <laughs> is okay. <laughs> okay, I have to give you and the name the of that. And the stickier and more boneless, the better. <laughs> <laughs> but you, so you, you see what yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. It's, 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 uh, so I, I don't know whether you'll be addressing that, George. I mean, what, one va fascinating thing, of course, is the fact that Picasso himself uh, was a lover of late Renoir. So, you yeah. know, there are two two of these uh, sumptuous paintings in the Musée Picasso. But I, I don't know what happened to, to us, because you also have Julius Meyer-Greffer, some, somebody mentioned him. Oh, Meyer-Greffer, yeah. yeah. Who in 1906, what, the, the Entwicklung des Impressionismus, what is the date of that book, Walter? 94. Thank you, thank you, I knew you would know. Yeah. Thank you. In, in 04, he says the late Renoir is by far the most, the, the m most important uh, artist of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, you know, this is kind of well, and for, for, for him, Cezanne is Poussin and Renoir is Rubens. Mm, yeah. they're, they're the two sides, and, the, and, and for art, each are necessary. Mm. You know, you need them yeah, both. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I've, I've, a lot, Barnes read Maya Greffe. Mm. I, I think that book was much more important for collecting history than we think. No, I agree. And I agree. it was translated into English almost immediately. It was translated to English like the year after it was published in German. Wow. So it's a, it's a book that is, I, I think Mayagreifa is, is neglected as a mm. source of collecting history. Yeah, yeah. And you know, also he liked Coro, but he didn't like the other mid-century, the other Barbizon people, mm. and his, his sense of things. And he liked Coro figure pictures. And Americans loved Coro figure pictures, not just the mm. gummy landscapes, yeah. late landscapes. Huh. Since we're on Mayo Greffer's uh, case, Mayo Greffer is a fantastic art historian. You should try to read him. It's, it's so much fun. So the guy was such a luminary. But since uh, Thomas Getgens uh, brought him up and, and Rick read that lecture and Thomas invited Rick to ad lib a little bit on that part, I, I wonder whether Thomas would be upset if we, if we dared do it right now. Oh, I think it's a good idea. Because, because if, you, if you look at it, and I, I don't know what Walter will, will say about that, but um, it was a, great specialist of Swiss art. Do you want to say something now, before I say it? Mm -hmm. 2008, okay. No, so 19, 1908. Oh, 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 t 1908, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> However, that's only because you know German. <laughs> For those of us who are linguistically challenged, it's very readable. <laughs> So, so with going back to what Gedgen uh, says about the, you know, the very strong and uh, very real opposite divide, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's almost a dis dis dichotomy between the Wilhelmine conservative court and the, 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 the close artist whom you saw Rick illustrate versus the cassiers and their, and their circles. Uh, is the, the fact that they, they were portrayed, uh, Lieberman, uh, all the artists and the collectors and the art dealers were, all had one thing in common. Yes, they were German, but they were Jewish. And the one guy, von Trudy, mm. Hugo von Trudy, uh, I checked my facts with Walter before saying that, uh, was a Swiss guy. Mm -hmm. So uh, Walter wanted me to say, er war ein Auslander Schweizer. Okay, thank you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but still. He was, not, uh, he was not German. Mm -hmm. So basically what you have is a, is a coterie of, of an art world, 
a parallel art world uh, that is seen as the uh, the introduction of, a, of an enemy, of an, of an Auslander, of an external factor within the, the court of the Wilhelmin Abra. And if I just can finish with, no, do you want to say it, right? Yeah, uh, Kessler, Harry Graf Kessler, Kessler, Kessler yes. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we did forget Kessler. Yes, uh, I think Getgens mentions him somewhere, yes. Was, was Kessler Jewish or not? No, no, okay. No, okay. no, no. So exception. Okay. The other, Graf. the other. You could be, you could be a Graf <laughs> and you could be Jewish. Look at the Rothschilds. <laughs> no, thank you. Lionel, do you want to open it up too? Since we seem to already be communicating with the yeah. audience. Yeah. Please <laughs> ask questions. Well. So, but please the wait till I bring a microphone to you when you ask your question. Okay. If some of you have questions to address to. George or any of us, please feel free. So now that we've been told where you live and what you own, who does your burglar alarm? <laughs> burglar alarm? <laughs> he has a small group of baby raccoons in the backyard, <laughs> and I assure you, you don't want to be bitten by them. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question of George. How do you, what is your modus operandi um, for absorbing what's out there on the market? Do you leaf through catalogs? Do you attend the auctions? Do you talk with other collector friends in Dallas? How, how do you go about sort of absorbing well, all that's well, all current? Of the, all of the above, but most of these were bought you know, we can okay. hear you. It, it's working. Yeah. All of the above. Most of these were bought in auction, or uh -huh. some of them bought buyed in. But, uh -huh. but I used a fellow named uh, Stephen Platzman for going to the auctions. Uh -huh. And if I like it, and Stephen likes it, and Rick likes it, the hardest part, <laughs> then it's, it's a, a go. <laughs> and there is a lot of conversation. We bring uh, uh, George lives not too far from UTD, where I teach, and so it's fun to go with the graduate students and really stand in front of things and look at them in different lights and, and talk to them. He really is obsessed with his works of art and knows a good deal more about them now than any of the rest of us do. Um, and, can be, and has these little PowerPoints, so you go through with the computer. Even Mrs. McDermott was looking at a computer screen, which is fascinating. And, and that kind of, and, and he uh, picks up what everybody's, I took a rich ladies group, which was kind of bizarre. We had all these like fancy ladies beautifully dressed and, and here's George looking at all these wonderful works of art and we had lunch. And it, the, it, there is something in a domestic setting when you can have a drink and you can eat and you can look at works of art before, during and after that and, and, and they change. They change because the light change. They change because your mood changes. They're part of a kind of shifting um, uh, corollary of looking and, and thinking and conversing, which is really, really important. And I, we saw so many photographs of private interiors during the course of this lecture. One could almost do a book of the interiors of collectors of Impressionism um, and actually think about the interiors themselves rather than just identifying um, the paintings in them and where you sit and in what kind of room certain things are and how you use them. And I, for me, it's such a privilege and it's the same in New York and it's the same in any great city, but um, to have in Dallas and Texas a whole coterie of collectors where you can look at things at different times of your life um, in different moods, run by with somebody. I remember taking John House to see a painting in another private collector by Re collection by Renoir. And I actually must say, I never really liked this painting very much. Um, and I was kind of mad at the collector for buying it. But John House was standing in front of it and he was, you know, it was just, he was in ecstasy. And because he was there and because he's such a good friend and because we were looking at it together, my whole idea of this painting changed. And my early view of it was deepened and altered um, by another person's uh, eye and another person's way of looking. And, and I think that, that's harder to happen in museums. It's, it's tougher because the environment is so formal and you move through and you scan and you never give yourself enough time with works of art. I mean, I always feel guilty when I leave a museum 
because I've looked at so many things in so little time. And when you live with pictures, it's the opposite. You look at them over and over and over and over again. Can I ask, George, does that mean, has anyone ever visited your house or you've had a kind of collector's play date kind of thing that's made you, that's made you change your mind or thinking about a picture you already own or made you want to move it to a different location? Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> no, I, I can't think of it. To offhand, could you think of anything no, like I, that? No, I can't. The, There's pa a, the paintings do get moved all the time. And he's a good lender, which is, and it's really wonderful to see your paintings in exhibitions because they change and they have different, there is one uh, painting by one of the artists, who so I can't say which one because it would be in bad taste, um, that is actually coveted by the Getty. And, you know, the whole idea of that. So we're discussing, you know, are they crazy? And what, you know, what do you think that they would pay for it? And would you monetize your collection? And of course, he's never done that. But it's sort of cool to think that you have hanging in your living room a painting that the Getty wants. <laughs> You've mentioned the eye, and all through this symposium, we've mentioned so many collectors with incredible eyes. Then we've also mentioned their advisors, and great advisors. And, and uh, Rick, in your lecture, you also very honestly uh, said that these collections were obviously assembled uh, meticulously and accumulated masterpieces. But we tend to forget um, the mistakes, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. and, and uh, what was part of this collection, but which is not remembered today. Yeah. In, in other words, um, we can also learn from our mistakes mm -hmm. as a collector, but today, and in the kind of market we are in, mistakes can end up being very expensive. Yeah. So um, I know that George, besides being well advised, is also um, uh, involved in studying in depth himself uh, what is looking at and what is buying in order to avoid these mistakes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I wish I could say that, but it's not true. <laughs> I'm pretty much a dog chasing squirrels in the park. That bought in? Go for it. <laughs> it, it, it. The buying in part is interesting because you think that when a picture is bought in, in other words, it doesn't get enough money to sell in the auction, and, it, and then it's kind of an embarrassment. I mean, who wants it? And oftentimes, those are the sleepers, and they're really interesting pictures in them. And it, it, he is, I think you bought two bought-ins, right? Three. 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 And, and I, you know, I'd never, in all the years that I've talked to collectors and worked with collectors, never had anybody who bought a bought-in picture, because it's like they're bad children or something. They're not, and what's fascinating with George is, and what's good about bought-in pictures is that you have time to consider them. It's not just the auction where there's this other person and three people no, on the phone. No, you don't. No, you don't, okay. Well, a little well, bit of time. Uh, well, the, my, my favorite story about a bought-in picture is the Renoir, the chrysanthemums bought in twice. <laughs> I'm pointing at Capera from Christie's. <laughs> it's not her fault. <laughs> well, what it was is it's white chrysanthemums, and apparently in China, in Japan, and Korea, you send white chrysanthemums to funerals. So, and so a whole market is out. Yeah. <laughs> and the story with that one was, I, I wasn't interested, I was out of money and all that, and Stephen's at the auction, and he's been, oh, this is so great, yeah, great, great, great. He bought in again, and so we concocted a bid right there while he's in the auction looking at something else. We concocted a bid to give to the Christie's president leaving the auction hall. And this was, Christie's and Sotheby's take turns going first. And this particular time, Christie's was going first and Sotheby's was the next night. And so we ended up with, we knew it was the second buy-in, so it was a relatively, a really good bid for me, let me put it that way. And it was owned by an estate. It was owned by the estate, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, so we said, okay, this is the offer, but it's only good for 24 hours. 
And so the implication would be that Christie's, uh oh, they're going to, he's going to spend that money at Sotheby's tomorrow if we don't <laughs> say yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's revealing state secrets. <laughs> well, that, that, that's my favorite story, but that's the sort of thing that happens when you're a private collector. You could respond to that sort of thing and make a decision fast. If you're a museum, there's no way you could do that. And this particular, does, do people know about Huguette Clark, the owner of this painting? That she was the empty mansion's heiress. She lived two blocks from here in a penthouse, and she that didn't leave for 25 years, and then she went to the hospital and decided she liked it better. The owners of the painting was her estate, was the estate in Santa Barbara, which she didn't visit for 50 years. It had gardeners, chefs, chauffeurs, everything ready to go, and she never came. And now it's the lawyers. And so that, if you know it's that, you can end up making, a, a, here's, a, here's a kind of a, a low ball offer. You guys have got 24 hours, mm -hmm. and they're going to accept it. One time we tried that with an oligarch from the former Soviet Union, and he said, not only is the answer no, I've just doubled the price for you. <laughs> <laughs> Why are contemporary prices higher now? Yeah. <laughs> how, how much time do we have to answer this question? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the question was, why is the contemporary market so much ahead of the Impressionist and modern market? Um, actually, we should say Impressionist market. Yeah because modern is different, because we, the shift, as I mentioned before, was when Picasso was beginning to be uh, the leading, obviously with Van Gogh, but uh, because Van Gogh is still um, ahead. Uh, th th those, again, are rules that each of you can disagree with, because they are market rules, and we are all allowed to disagree with the market, but, uh, but the market tends to dictate its own rules and um, now when it comes to analyzing why the contemporary market is uh, there's more supply definitely um, larger number of buyers new generations among the new generation of, of collectors I see fewer who can project themselves living with impressionist paintings but that might be wrong in China we shall see, <laughs> and um, uh, that's that's. Uh, th there is clearly a more, much more speculative market in in the contemporary field than in the impressionist market. In comparison, r appears to be much more um, quiet and regular, and not subject to heavy speculation anymore. But don't you think, Leonel, it's also like um, the collectors we were talking about, the sort of pioneer or root collectors who bought a lot, in, or it was contemporary then, and they were speculating it to a certain extent, and many of them formed very large collections, which they parted with throughout their lives. And I, I mean, in my city, there are four contemporary collections that have more than 1,000 paintings each in them. So that kind of scale of buying um, for contemporary art is just like the scale of buying of contemporary art in the 1870s and 80s and, and 90s. So I think it's not so different. I think it's just, you know, shifted through because we live in a different time. Yeah, and you've mentioned the word time. So the only difference is that five years in the contemporary market is a very long time now yeah. when it was a very short time. Uh, previously. So now over a period of five years you can have tremendous changes and shifts. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that the, uh, the contemporary art market uh, is, has opened up to a, a whole uh, new generation of, of buyers who tend to be dominated by what we call the hedge fund industry and uh, it's a very very different mentality from Bertha Portobello. Uh, you or, or anyone we've mentioned, really. There's a, a sense of uh, respecting and admiring, uh, taking high risks, uh, speed, uh, 
courageous craziness. So, so Andy Warhol is much better fit to on, to answer that kind of uh, that kind of psychological equipment than Monet or Renoir, if you see what I mean, women, who are much more easy to live with, much more placid and satisfactory. We don't want anything satisfactory. Challenge, speed, risk, yeah, fear. I agree. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and I think it's James. No, it was the same. Yeah, did, did I was afraid somebody would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been afflicted with the disease of art collecting. When I was a kid, I would buy reproductions on, on cardboard and put them in my bedroom instead of a normal kid. And back then, Robert Wood, do you remember him, was the, the king of the cardboard reproduction. And I had a few of his, and I had the Impressionist, mm. Maloon de la Galette. Mm. And... Later on, as I became an adult, I'd just go to local galleries, and in the back of the gallery would be some old French painting from the 50s and 60s, nobody that Rick would approve of for sure, but they were very French. And so I would get those, and they would be inexpensive. I'd blow on them, the dust would come up. And so once I got lucky and I could afford to get museum quality art, I immediately thought, well, I'd like French. Let's go pre-World War II, and oh my gosh. Let's go Impressionism, and it just, it just seemed like a better deal. And, and you talk about being, to live, I buy the Impressionist art to live with. It's not necessarily to be held for a profit and then resold. And I think they're easier to live with, at least for me, than, than most contemporary art. Most contemporary art needs to be a little bit in your face. And I love contemporary art, but it's nice the collectors we have in Dallas keep it in quasi-public museums. They don't live with the contemporary art. That's true. Or in warehouses, yeah. Well, on that note, in the home of Henry Clay Frick, who according to his daughter always wanted to own pictures that are pleasant to live with, I think I would like to thank the four of you for serving on this panel. Thank you. Thank you.